Today we are going to start our case in France before moving to South America. So sit back as we go to the early 20th century. Amade Briere Lacroix, better known as Emile Dubois, was born on the 29th of April 1867 in a small fishing village in the region of Pas de Calais in northern France. His father named Joseph worked as a blacksmith while his mother named Marie looked after their small house. At the time, life was hard in France. The economy was not doing well and there was not much work. Often the only employment opportunities available were those that offered poor pay and harsh working conditions. On the 19th of July 1870, when Emile was just three years old, the Franco-Prussian War began. This was a conflict between the Second French Empire and the North German Confederation, led by the Kingdom of Prussia. The war ended on the 28th of January 1871 and did not go well for France. The country lost the regions of Alsace and Lorraine. It also resulted in the deterioration of the French economy. Unemployment increased and it was estimated that one third of the French population, which was about 8 million people, lived in poverty. Since the 18th century, there had been a steady flow of French people travelling to Chile. Many were merchants who arrived in the port city of Concepcion. Others were wine producers who cultivated grapevines and built haciendas in the country's central valley. But by the second half of the 19th century, many less well-off French citizens, such as farm workers, shopkeepers and tradesmen, made the journey from their homeland to South America. Emile's family, however, stayed in France. Due to the economic conditions, they had to work when other opportunities arose. So young Emile was mainly raised by his grandparents. They were hard-working, honest people who had received very little education and struggled to read and write. They realised that in order to progress in modern France, Emile would need to study hard at school. They encouraged him to visit his local library and to read as many books as he was able. However, like many children in the early 1880s, Emile's parents needed him to work in order to help with the family finances. So he joined his father in the forge. He was a good worker, but it soon became apparent that his preference was to read and continue to try and educate himself further. When he was 15 years old, he became romantically involved with a young lady named Marie Rose. Unfortunately for Emile, her father didn't agree with the relationship. He was a retired policeman and was very strict with his daughter. He wanted to make sure that she made the most of their modest status and that she married into a more affluent family. He did not consider that Emile would be able to provide for her. When he realised that Emile's intentions towards his daughter were not honourable, he challenged him and the two started to argue. Emile was enraged that Maria Rose's father had questioned him about his feelings towards her and he attacked him. He knocked him to the ground and not staying to see how he was. He quickly ran off. He then remembered that the gentleman was a retired police officer with many friends who had authority in the area. So in a panic, he packed a bag and fled. Eventually, he arrived at the village of Corrier and telling everyone that his name was Emile Dubois, he obtained work in a coal mine. It was hard, tiring work, long hours in very poor conditions. His fellow mine workers liked him, but were also wary of him. He would often challenge authority, was sometimes violent, and would always carry a knife. His short temper became apparent after a heated argument with his boss. Instead of doing what his boss had asked, he pulled out his knife and attempted to attack him. Fortunately, the foreman was on hand to calm the situation, and Emil went back to work. However, two weeks later, the boss with whom Emil had argued was found dead. Emil was suspected of killing him, but before an investigation began, he left and headed to Spain. He eventually arrived in Barcelona, where he found work in a theatre company. He liked the theatre, but his short temper and erratic behaviour did not endure him to his fellow workers. So when he was 20 years old, he left Spain and boarded a ship, heading for Venezuela. When he arrived, he found work in a mine, close to the port city of Maracaibo. But again, he seemed unable to accept authority. He got into conflict with the management and even started a miners' strike. 
he left and joined the Venezuelan army, rising to the rank of captain. When he returned to Maracaibo, he befriended two young ladies, named Catalina and Ursula, and they followed him to Peru. Here he wanted to find different employment, but he was experienced in mining, so started to work in the mines, close to the coastal city of Callao. Emil did not like the work. It consisted of long hours, poor conditions and low pay. He was barely earning enough to support himself. He was, however, a very resourceful young man. And when he had saved enough money, he left Peru and travelled to Colombia. Here he became a French literature teacher. He also told people he was a vet and would charge them to diagnose and treat their sick and injured animals. He seemed to like to reinvent himself and to get by in any way he could. He would tell elaborate stories about his qualifications and profession. This, however, did prove somewhat problematic when people realised that they had paid him for advice that he was not qualified to give. In 1903, he went to live in Ecuador, again finding work as a miner. Here he met a Peruvian engineer named Senor Niera. The pair became good friends and would often meet after work. Senor Niera told Emil that now he had saved enough money, he was going to return to Lima to get married. Emil congratulated his friend. A few days later, however, Senor Niera was found dead. He had been stabbed and his savings had been stolen. Emil was questioned about the murder, but the police had no evidence to charge him. Soon after, he left Peru and travelled to Chile, arriving in the country's capital, Santiago. Both Catalina and Ursula had followed him on his journey from Venezuela, but by now, Ursula had grown tired of his ways his strange moods, and never knowing how long they would stay in one particular place. She had stayed more to support her friend Catalina, who had given birth to Emil's son a few years earlier. But now, as the boy was getting older, she decided she would be better off in her homeland, so packed her suitcase and left. Emil wished her well and settled down with Catalina, who he introduced as his wife. They moved to an affluent neighbourhood, where many of the richest families lived. Many had come to Chile from Europe and had started lucrative businesses in the city. Emile soon befriended a wealthy French gentleman named Ernest Lafontaine. He worked as a lawyer and had businesses in Santiago and Valparaiso. He was also the first mayor of the town of Providencia. A gentleman named Ramon Diaz visited Ernesto Lafontaine's office but he was horrified to find his mutilated body lying on the floor. The police were called and discovered that there were items missing from the deceased, including a gold watch, the keys to a safe and a large amount of cash. They questioned Emil and asked him why he had blood on his clothes and shoes. He stated that he had killed a chicken for dinner as his son was sick and hungry and needed it for a good broth. He was always good with words and the police dismissed him from their list of suspects. Emil decided to leave Santiago. He travelled 75 miles northwest to the coastal city of Valparaiso. Again, he moved to a nice neighbourhood and started to frequent social clubs and restaurants. He was also keen to get to know the more affluent residents of the city. His acting skills, learnt years earlier in Barcelona, meant that he was able to charm the people he met. Most described him as a respectable, educated gentleman with a good sense of humour. Emil, however, was not planning to befriend anyone. All he wanted to do was gather information about them. He kept a diary where he wrote about different people's daily routines. All were well-off gentlemen, such as lawyers, doctors and business traders who were in charge of the commerce at the port. On the 4th of December 1904, a British businessman called Ronaldo Tillman, who had his premises at Blanco Street, was found dead in his office. He had been stabbed. When the police arrived, they noticed that the safe was open and its contents had disappeared. However, the victim's daughter told them that there was in fact nothing more than a few coins in the safe, as she had taken all the money from it just a few hours before her father's body was discovered. Emil had become acquainted with a wealthy German gentleman named Gustavo Titus. He was a rich businessman and owned a large and profitable mine. 
It had not been difficult for Emil to befriend him, as he had worked for many years in the mines, and the two gentlemen would often discuss the issues surrounding mining. Emil soon learned that on the 4th of October, his friend was going to travel the 25 miles to his mine close to the town of Limanche with the wages for the miners. Gustavo would always withdraw the money from the bank and travel directly to his mine, but for some reason, this time he returned to his office before leaving. When he did not arrive to pay the miners, the authorities were alerted. They went to his office and discovered that the gentleman was dead. He had been stabbed. All the money for his workers, along with jewellery, had been taken. By April 1905, Emil found himself with very little money. This was a problem if he was to keep up the appearance of a respectable, educated and affluent gentleman. He asked a fellow Frenchman named Isidoro Chal if he would lend him some money. Isidoro was 63 years old and owned a shop in Valparaiso. The pair had known each other socially for some time. Mr Chal, however, refused Emile's request. He had always wondered how Emile earned his money and thought him to be a somewhat strange character. He told him that if he needed money, he should work rather than rely on the good nature of friends and acquaintances. Emile felt very offended. Mr Shell should not speak to him in such a disrespectful manner. He had only asked for a small loan and there was no reason for the gentleman to react so discourteously. On the evening of the 4th of April, the body of a man was found in an alleyway near the city's French club. He had been stabbed. The body was later identified to be the French shopkeeper, Isidoro Chal. Although the police investigated the murder, there were no witnesses, and each time they followed a lead, it never led to an arrest. On the 2nd of June 1905, a mill went to the property of a wealthy American dentist named Charles Davis. Mr Davis was 70 years old, but fit for his age. He lived in a very nice apartment in the Plaza Anibal Pinto, situated in the centre of the city. According to Emil's meticulous notes, the dentist shouldn't have been home, so he went to the address and tried to get into the property. He had many master keys, and usually it was easy for him to unlock a door. However, this one proved more difficult than usual. Unbeknown to Emil, Mr Davis was in fact still at home, and when he realised that someone was trying to enter his apartment, he hid behind a door and waited. When Emil finally pushed through and entered the hallway, Mr Davies jumped on him. A scuffle followed, which ended when Emil hit the gentleman in the head with a heavy object and ran out of the building. Mr Davies, however, was not badly injured, so got up and raised the alarm. The civil guard were quickly in pursuit of his assailant, and when passers-by realised that someone was trying to escape the authorities, they assisted in the chase. With so many people running after Emil, it did not take long for him to be apprehended. Emil Dubois was charged with breaking into Mr Davies's house and attacking him. Emil, however, denied the charge. He said that he was the victim, and it was in fact Mr Davies who had attacked him. The judge listened to his arguments, and then presented Emil with the evidence against him. He was sent to prison, while the police continued a further investigation. The civil guard interviewed Emil, but he was very vague in his answers, so they decided to search his house. Here they found his notebook with his list of victims, along with items that had been stolen from them, including the gold watch that had belonged to Ernest Lafontaine. They also found the knife he had used, and many master keys he used for his crimes. Emile Dubois was charged with murder. At his trial, the evidence against him was clear, and many old acquaintances testified against him. They told the court that he was a devious and cunning man. Emile's lawyer knew that the chances of an acquittal were slim, so he decided to construct the defence by pointing out that the defendant was mentally unstable. While this would not mean that Emil could be freed, it would mean that the judge would not be able to issue a sentence of death. However, when Emil heard of this, he was horrified. He dismissed his lawyers and started to conduct his own defence. He made up all sorts of tales 
about how he happened to be in possession of all the stolen items from the victims, all of whom had been well known to him. He was such a good actor, but it seemed that the people of Valparaiso were on his side. They believed that Emil was not a guilty man, but the victim of a conspiracy by the wealthy residents of the city against a humble, honest gentleman who had been experiencing difficult times. Despite this, he was found guilty and sentenced to death. He was sent back to prison, where he remained for several months. During this time, he tried to escape many times with other inmates. Emil continued to plead his innocence. He spoke of the great injustice being committed to a poor French immigrant by the city's aristocracy. He gained much sympathy from the majority of the residents of the city. Despite his pleas and the support he received, he was executed by firing squad on the 26th of March 1907. He requested not to be blindfolded as he claimed he was innocent of the crimes for which he was charged. This is one of the most notorious cases in the history of Chile and Emile Dubois is still considered by some as a charming, handsome, well-travelled and intelligent gentleman who was unjustly sentenced to death. He was buried in a mass grave at the cemetery of Playa Ancha in Valparaiso, where today there is a shrine to his name, where people come and pray and ask for favours. Hello everyone, and thank you so much for listening. As usual, please leave any comments or feedback you may have, and I hope to see you all again in the next Brief Case.